Sophia by Laura Ferrero, translated by Ruth Donnelly. Sophia, I wanted to tell you a love story, yours. Although you know, I guess, that not all love stories end well. These things happen, Sophia. But what is there left to tell you? You know it all already. I've spent a lot of time thinking about how to tell you this, where to start. Beginnings are important. They determine the rest of the story. I met your father at university. At that time, we were just two likeable, attractive kids, innocent. Now, we both have a few more wrinkles on our foreheads, at the corners of our mouths. Wrinkles too, if you'll forgive the schmaltz, in our hearts. But not then. We were two good kids with our whole lives ahead of us. We had lots of dreams, ambitions. At that time, each of us was seeing someone, but you know what it's like when you're 18. Things come and go. It's not like now, when everything's heavy and binding. Now, there are kids and mortgages, jobs for life. Before, decisions were made lightly. One day you might do one thing, the next another. Everything had a relative weight. If it didn't turn out well, you had a whole lifetime to change it. We spent our student years watching each other, observing each other. In the university corridors, at a party, in class. We looked at each other. Sometimes we even spoke to each other, but afterwards each of us returned to his or her life. Your father was always a serious boy. I like to imagine that one day, years later, I would bump into him and by then we'd be grown-ups. Back then, being a grown-up meant being 25 with your own flat, doing up a house, having a job full of meetings, drinking G&T in the evening. I lost sight of him for a while. I finished my studies, started my thesis, travelled. I saw the worst of things and the best of things. I collected experiences, because as a child I was taught that you have to do everything life has to offer. I became many different people, and I lived at opposite ends of the earth. I made some good decisions, some really bad ones too. There are even some I haven't made yet. I realised that most of us end up becoming tightrope walkers, living on the edge. The abyss was always there. Make no mistake, that's not a metaphor. The years teach you that you are only ever moments away from losing everything. During that time I read a lot. I understood some of the things the book spoke about. Other, th other things I look for in people, often the wrong ones. Don't believe, Sophia, that all that stuff about getting life right is easy. But if there's one thing I was left with, it was this. Every day there are more stones in this backpack we all carry. Heavy, that's the word. The first book I read as a teenager was Letter to a Child Never Born by Oriana Falacci. I found it hard going. She should have decided to bring the child into the world from the start. Look, I was 13 years old and I thought that in life one makes decisions in advance, before the event, like ordering a pizza on the phone. I ordered myself loads of things. I'll do this, I'll do that. I forbade myself things too. I'll never do this, nor that. I dictated exactly what I wanted from life, and I was set on what I would become. My mother warned me, not everything is as simple as it seems. When I turned 24, I wrote a single sentence in my diary. I don't want to die. I was in Peru. I'd realised that the fact of collecting experiences acted as a spring against death, but at the end of the day, we would all die anyway. Go, go, go. Trains, planes, journeys, bags. But I didn't want to die. I felt that life was like an eel, always slipping away from us. One day I was 25 and I ran into your father at the old university entrance. Hey, how are you doing? He was wearing a suit and his shoes were rubbing. I had very long hair and was still biting my nails. From then on we saw each other, we talked, we had fun. We were excited, at least about each other, because we were the same. Time had passed, but we still had our whole lives ahead of us, and the feeling that now we could live it together. It was a kind of second chance. Believe me, I always knew you would come, Sophia. For a long time before you arrived, we talked about this dream of having you, although your father was never on board with your name. He used to laugh at me, saying it was too royalist. Sophia means wisdom. That's why I wanted to call you that, so you'd be born wise, or at least a little wiser than me. The first time we saw you, you were just a tiny grain of sand on an ultrasound. That was you. But let's get back to the story. Your father and I loved each other from the start. We didn't love each other well, but we tried to. We were, afraid, we were afraid youth would get away from us, and we messed up. Yes, beginnings shape stories. Nevertheless, we had that dream in our heads, that promise to love each other. Do you know what I'm talking about? That mental photograph of love. But the truth is that every day more fear grew between us, and we didn't want to know. That happens between couples. Chasms are formed names and words that can't be spoken. We formed part of an unfinished painting. 
and we didn't want or know how to ask ourselves if what we were living was what we had promised ourselves as teenagers. One grows up with certain ideals. I wanted a father who really wanted my child. He, a family that wasn't full of silences, of distance. It's true, we all want what we can't have. In the end, when you arrived, ten years had passed since we met. We were 28, and a week before he'd gifted me a pretty dress after we'd blown out the candles together. I really loved him, as I think you do love the father of your child. But we lost each other somewhere along the way. The days wrapped themselves around us, holding us back. We lived in the same house, but we couldn't find each other anymore. That happens. Closeness has nothing to do with space. That's just something they tell you when you're little. Sometimes the same thing happens with your father as with you. I don't know where he's gone, or where he is. I only know that a month after my 28th birthday, your father came with me to a clinic with very white walls. I took my clothes off and they gave me one of those paper, paper aprons. I closed my eyes. Think about something pleasant, they said, but I couldn't think about anything pleasant. A few hours later, I fainted in a cafe I'd gone into for an orange juice. My stomach was empty and I was still under the effects of the anaesthetic. I stood up, wobbly, and managed to get as far as the bathroom. I fell. Your father caught me, and the two of us stayed in the bathroom and twined on the floor. He was holding me, but you weren't there anymore. I don't know if youth can be lost in a day. I know I lost it then, on that bathroom floor. Sometimes, you'll be surprised to know, I look for you among the kids in the park. I compare you with my friends' children, even tell myself you would be cleverer, prettier. You'd be nearly three years old. It was you, Sophia, I already knew, and I didn't know how to wait for you because your father and I were still two kids who couldn't take care of anyone other than themselves. You know what? Children who are never born count too. Parents who never come to be are parents forever, in some strange way, in one of those ways that you'll never find in the dictionary. I often have the feeling that life keeps leaving us with carcasses, with things that have a recognisable shape, but are empty. After you left, I developed a strange habit. I couldn't go to sleep without first clinging onto your father's arm. I clung onto it with my whole body, as if his arm were going to save me from something, as if it were a branch. Then I would think about you, in that place we give to children who are never born. For several months I gave myself over to crying on the sofa in the evenings, and watching the rain and the snow fall outside. Then I would get into bed and cling onto an arm. I told myself that this was no life for a young girl. But tell me, do you know what a life is? Do I? Sometimes love stories end like that on the bathroom floor of a cafe. Now we're over 30 already. Your father isn't here, and nor are you. What little remains of children who are never born, less even than of couples who cease to be. Not even photos. I threw away the ultrasound, the only proof I had that you were here inside me. I tore it up and didn't want to see it again. Life is like that, Sophia. You look back and it takes a while to understand the pain. Because the pain changes, but it doesn't go away. It takes on new forms, occupies different spaces. And I'll say to you what everyone always says. I don't know what happened to us, but I see you. I imagine you walking, taking those clumsy steps that now you'll only ever take in my imagination. A little while ago, somebody told me that when I think about you, I should light a candle, but I never have. So I'm lighting you a story. For you, Sophia, because by the time I'd worked things out, it was too late. And for your father, too. This is a story for both of you. But forgive me, because these are things you already know. The truth is, Sophia, I just wanted to tell you a love story.